Uh, well, I'm Raimon Iskanen from the OTP team at Ericsson. You may hear from my accent and name that I'm from Sweden, but the name is Finnish. It was my father who moved to Sweden to find work and became a mining engineer. My mother worked with drawing maps. That is, she worked as a 2D plotter, flatbed plotter. So today. Her entire craft got entirely obsoleted by digital maps. Well, but it was on a mine office, the map office of a copper and zinc mine in Sweden in the 70s, the first time I saw a computer. One of the mass co-workers tried to demonstrate something for me. And all I remember that he, he typed something in the, on the teletype, something strange. Oops. That was also something strange. Oh, wait a minute. He typed I equals I plus one. And I, I was thinking, that doesn't make much sense, really. I cannot be equal to Y plus, plus one. Well, anyway, time goes by. And about 20 years later, programming most of them, I've gotten used to the idea of assignment. And then I took a course on uh, concurrent programming uh, in Sweden and met Erlang for the first time and found out that my initial gut feeling about basic had been right. And I cannot equal I plus one, but J can be bound to I plus one. I had found functional programming with single assignment. And a few years later, I joined the O2P team at Ericsson. That was at the, at the start of this millennium. Uh, about two years later, for OTP 19, I wrote Jens Staten, a state machine behavior intended to replace Jan FSM that had got issues, so to say. Everybody at least thought it had got issues. Jens Staten has replaced Jan FSM already for our SSH and SSL applications. They were rewritten in the same time as 19. And the rewrite was successful. I think we got rid of some bugs, actually. Uh, the tool you never know you always wanted was a review I got from a guy you might have heard of in the community, in the coffee break, in the user conference, whatever it was named last year in Stockholm. So just to be sure everybody's on the same page, a state machine is a model for how a machine acts on input. Um, we often in this domain talk about event-driven state machines. It was already invented for handling electronics, so the, what was an event wasn't that clear. It was a clock or something. But here we talk about event-driven state machines, especially, especially when it comes to actual languages. So the machine has got a set of states. The machine can be in one state at a time. When an event occurs, it changes the states. It makes a state transi transition. During the transition, it makes some kind of action. This is often the useful thing it does, like an ATM machine giving you money. Um, Gen FSM got its name from finite state machine, in an abbreviation. The set of states need to be finite, the set of events need to be finite. And since you had to write code for each state, that, that will be a finite set of states. Okay, we can visualize the state machine with a state diagram or with a state transition table two common ways. You see here we start in the state ready, and when the event coin plus occurs, we go to state paid on the way we do the action enable, which means now here, enable the null. You see the same thing in the transition table. We have the states on the rows and the events on the columns. When we are in state ready, get event paid, we go to Sorry, get event coin plus. Go to event paid on the way, way we do uh, the action enable. Um, they say the same information, but the table says, sub says something more. It says, you have empty boxes here. They ask the question, what should I do if I get a um, coin plus event in state open, for instance? Uh, you handle, have to handle these cases too. Then this is not written in the diagram. And in the, Another thing that's not written in a state diagram often is uh, status queries. They would become something like, in a state, you get an event that is a question, then you do an action that is answer the question, and you get back to the same state. So we would have, for every kind of query, you would have a small loop in the state diagram. So that would just clutter it all. And in the trans transition table, you would, you would get a column for a new event that does the same thing for every row. So not so useful there either. So this is often by the 
subtext, for instance, subtext here says enable will enable the knob. So if you get a twist when you're not in paid, you should reject it somehow. You can understand that, but it's not in the diagram. So this is often in subtext or inside notes of some kind. So that was introduction. I will now go to the background for Jan Staten and the goals. Some concepts uh, about state machines in these languages. I'll go through Jan Staten features, all of them actually. I have a code lock example, a summary, and hopefully time for the questions also. So, oh yes, sorry about that. Uh, my 15 year old daughter thinks that this is PowerPoint. He, she helped me on two, state, on two slide transitions. See if you can find it, you can see the other one. I seem to have lost my sheets. This could have gone better. There you are. GenFSM was considered hard to use. Anyone here tried to use GenFSM? Have you got an opinion about what its problem is? Otherwise, I might tell you later. Uh, there were suggestions, for instance, plain FSM by Ulf Wieger. He used the parse transform around the receive statements to automate handling of system attributes. I used, I've chosen a, pupa, a butterfly pupa to, to symbolize transform. Okay, sorry, parse text. Um, I myself tried to use GenFSM in the project, but gave up. I used GenServer with a helper function instead. Uh, that helper function did some of the things that Jens Dayton does today, a few of them, just. This solution actually runs in an Ericsson product now delivered. Um, then later I created a, pull, created a pull request about the first version for Jens Dayton, uh, submitted, it, submitted it, and it got a fairly agitated, agitated discussion, if you read it. Uh, there were lots of changes, but the outcome was really good. Among the goals, or that it should be a behavior, a gen behavior. So you should not have to bother with pass transforms and you also get si handling system messages by being a behavior. Uh, it should have something like select and receive. And why that is important, I will come to that later. Um, it should have state-oriented callback code. It should be able to write state-oriented callback code. I will also explain why later. So, the relevant state machine concepts here. A machine, that is, is a process. An event is a process message. And a state is some kind of variable in a process. It can be the code pointer, it can be a value in the behavior engine, it can be a behavior that the module, the callback module handles. Just to illustrate, for, for someone from Texas, the code beam event could cause a state change. Um, <coughs> here is a very simple state machine. It's written in plain Erlang. It has not func any function API. Simply when it receives a push event, it will do the action count plus one and go to the next state. I also have a um, status query here. The get count will answer the count and go to the same state. That is state in state. The state here is actually the receive statement, that is the code pointer of the receive statement is the actual state. The function is there to, just to give it a name. Otherwise, it would not be possible to go from the off state to the off state. You could write another, another receive, receive statement here, but you cannot reach it from any other place. So the code pointer is, is the state here. This machine will queue any unknown events. Uh, this is a very nice pattern. It, it was this that plain FSM was wanting. And then you wrote uh, something around the receive statement to get a parsed and form handling system message and so on, that stuff, to be, so become a behavior. Regarding gen, the behavior concepts, it, it kind of <coughs> divides events into classes by the API functions. We have costs, calls, and infos that don't have API functions. Uh, a, Cost is simply an event with a dedicated API function, nothing else. The call is the same, but it, the part of the action is also in the definition. If you don't reply to the call, you don't have a call. 
So it's both, both the, action, uh, the event and part of the action. And these infos can come from, for instance, socket messages, monitors, timers, and such stuff. So you, sometimes you just, it's, it's essential that you handle them. A behavior, and again, handles all the system messages that you don't need to know about. Uh, it makes the, the process fit into a supervision tree and so on. Uh, that is, it has to handle all system mess messages all the time. Therefore, it has to give the callback module all messages all the time. It cannot buffer, so to say. Uh, LXE behaviors are just wrappers, API wrappers on the gen behaviors. They use the same engine behind. So they just make the API look more, more elixirish. Uh, the semantics of, uh, uh, of your API is what decides which one you use. If you need to have a call in your module, then you have to use a, co a call. I, I'm trying to say that as a programmer, you often don't have a choice in should I use calls or infos, that I must use all of them often which means I must handle all of these classes, which means I have a callback module that, that handles all of these callbacks. Um, another thing about the gen, sorry, again, missed that one. Uh, gen server also has got uh, a possibility from call to return a reply directly from the call, that kind of reply will end up with a sys-trace. A sys-trace is something, a feature in the sys module that is useful on behaviors. You can get the state, you can activate the trace, and this is not the same thing as a normal trace mechanism. It's some, just something built in, the in the, all the gen behaviors. They are useful for debugging. So this kind of reply will give um, a reply that shows up in a sys-trace. If you use the gen server reply instead, it will not show up in the sys-trace shortcoming. There is a timeout for the next event. That timeout has a little peculiar, peculiar sorry, I want to try that again, uh, that if the, it gets a system message by waiting for a timeout, it has to restart the timeout. So the timeout might, might actually get longer than you thought. Uh, the NFSM has got the same ID, but it's not called calls and calls. It's called events and synchronous events. And we have two variants. We have one that is state specific and one that is not state specific of both calls and calls. The infos are all not state specific. The call variants may return a reply as before. It will show up in the sys trace. If you use gen FSM reply, it will not show up in the sys trace. The timeout is just as in gen server. Nothing different really. The state name is an atom here because it must be able to be a function name. You also have a state data so that is an any term. The gen statum looks a bit differently. <coughs> here we have one callback that takes uh, the, co the class of the event as a type instead. So we have cast type, call, input, timeout, and at least one more. There also is an idea of a callback mode. So you select the callback mode, and then you get all your callbacks, either state-specific or state non specific and then it, it's an argument here instead. In this case, it has to be an atom, the state. In this case, it can be any term. So you can make a, as complex term at state as you like. But you also have got the state data in both modes. Among these, uh, the, the return value here both sets the next state or and update the data and has a list of actions. Among these actions are reply. You can make multiple replies. All shows up in the sys trace. If you use gen statum reply, it will not show up in the sys trace. And there are three kinds of timeouts. I just show one here. Okay. So, you remember this picture, we realize that the game here is to cover all combinations of states and events. We need a strategy. One good strategy is to be focused on one uh, state and find out, do we handle all events here? That's one strategy. Um, we can think otherwise, of course, but this is kind of how we all think. 
what are my options? What should I do if the door opens? What happens then? If I go out, then I'm in another state. What should I do then? So this is how you think logic. But there are other situations. If you have a status, status query, you know that in any state, it will be handled the same. So there you can think state or uh, event oriented. But normally you think event oriented. Sorry, state oriented. Oh, you understand. <coughs> Um, gen server kind of makes it hard to focus on one state at a time because, as I said, you in general need to handle all three classes of callbacks and you get them split out in three different functions. So your state code is split out in three different functions. Gen state then, then tries to solve this by having a state, uh, state specific callbacks, but still have the separation in three, in three classes. Furthermore, it has got state-specific and non-specific callbacks, which are selected by the API. So you have to select that this kind of event should go to the state-specific and the other should go to a state-common callback. So now you have to state code in five different functions per state. This, I think, is the problem with GenFSM. It tried to solve the, tried to get state-oriented callback, but failed. While state, GenStatum has got this one callback and events on the types on the events instead, which makes it easier to think state-oriented. Another thing that helps in, in, this, in solving this puzzle is selective receives. The solution to the question, what should I do to open in coin class, might simply be, I handle it later. Uh, it makes sense in the, the ready state, and it doesn't hurt if I just ignore it. But with the FSM, you had to handle all events immediately, because the behavior has to be ready for the next system event. So you get the event shoved down your throat, and you don't want it. So you must think, all right, I reject it instead. Or you have to write some kind of queue of your own. It can be just a variable, but it's sti still a queue, really. In GenStatum, you can postpone an event instead, which is, which is the replacement for select and receive, um, which I will explain now. The receive statement tells you what to consume, and all other things are ignored. And the callback in Jens data will give you all events, but you have the option to opt out, manana. Um, this means I will not see this in this state. When I change states, then I will get this event back. But for now, I just ignore it. I will, I won't, remind, remind me later, please. So we have there. We have an implicit uh, postponing here, an implicit queuing uh, of all other events, and here we have an explicit queuing of the events we want to queue. This means that in this case we can reject all unknown events. Uh, with receive, we have to group all unknown events with the unwanted ev events. So this pattern gives better control of the queue. Okay, now uh, for a feature walkthrough. Okay, I mentioned the callback mode. There are two, state functions and handle event functions. Uh, with state functions, you get a state-specific callback. With handle event functions, you get a handle event, the, a common callback with a state as an argument. GenFSM had got, as you know, two sets of APIs instead that you selected in, in, the, in the code. Uh, this is selected by a callback function. So the callback mode is a property of the code. If you want to know what the code can do, you go ask the code. This solved a problem regarding code downgrade that was unsolvable. Uh, the value of it is cached, so it's just Asked, it's called once after init and once after code change. So for most, just once. So you should return a constant. I do have a test case that does other things, but please not in production. Um, the event handler has four parameters in both modes, as you see. In one case, and in the, this mode, is, it is the name that is the fourth parameter, and here it is in argument instead. It returns the next state. Uh, after the data and action. This is a list of actions. I'll get back to the actions later. 
if the next state is the same as the sta this state, it is not a state change. If it's a different, compares differently, that is matching compare, unequal, then you have a state change. Um, the, these are also shorthands for a keep state as a shorthand is the tuple that does not have a next state field. And keep state and data does not have a new data field either. These are not just shorthands. They are useful when you go down in a handler function deep and you don't want to pass the state in it because you can return this value instead and don't know the state. So it reduces the number of parameters you need to pass around. And you can even throw keep state and data from deep within some handling function that, that you've got. You don't have to return all the way. We have also the stop tuples, stop tuples. I believe how that is pronounced. Uh, we have a variant of that one that is reply first, stop then. This will give you the possibility to get uh, the replies in the sys trace before stopping. Otherwise, as you know, if you call a loop, the, the, the function is that it will be lost. There is also a one called repeat state that will repeat the state enter call that I have not talked about yet, but we'll get into that. How to handle common events? Well, GenFSM tried, but failed. Uh, when you have the callback mode handle uh, event function, that is one callback function, this is not a problem. You just handle the code that you would like to, but when you have state-specific callbacks, you in general end up writing a final clause that calls one function of your own to handle all common events. A nice pattern. You can do this with this kind of macro that uses the function name macro. In that case, these three lines become that line. Since you often have many states, it becomes more real. I would like to see Elixir macro for this. I have tried myself, but it seems to be a little harder. It, they don't have this function name macro. So it's harder to dig out that state. Uh, the event types, uh, they have distinct gen server flavor. There are casts, calls, and infos, simply. This slide only shows the state specific callback. You can have the other callback mode, of course. Nothing, nothing much more to say about that. Um, there are more event types. These are called by an action you do yourself. So the timeout action will produce a timeout event and so on. They ha have got the same tag for the action as for the timeout, the, for the event type. We have also got an internal uh, event type that can be inserted. In fact, it can only be inserted. If you get this event, you have inserted it yourself. You have no excuse. <coughs> These are the actions. These were the event types, not here are actions. The reply action will reply. It has got a destination. So you can reply to any call from any callback. You can reply to a call when you get the TCP message that it was related to and still get it in the sysstrace. Um, the postpone action will postpone the current event, this one you are holding right now, and it will be enqueued and retried when you do a state change. The next event action will assert uh, this action as the next one to process message to yourself, what to do now. If you insert more than one, the first one you insert will be the first one you, pro first you process. The hibernate action will hibernate your server until the next event. <coughs> There's also a, a start option for the server that um, will hibernate after a certain time. Uh, when hibernating, you minimize the memory footprint for the process. It takes some time to throw away all data and takes some time to get back again. So you don't do this just for any reason, is when you really need to shrink the memory. Um, this one does not combine very well with, with, for instance, next event, because if you insert an event, then hibernate, then you have an event to wake up. So all you have done is wait, waste CPU. Here, you may recognize these. I talked about them as event types recently. Here are the actions. The event timeout is not restarted by system messages. It's a normal timer. The state timeout is cancelled automatically by state change. This is often very useful for state machines. You know something, you know you're going to be in, in this state for a certain time. So this one is the one you use. There's also a generic timeout that gives you the opportunity to set the name of the timer. And these are all just wrappers on the Erlang timer functions. 
So what the, the end statement does for you is that it handles the ref timer reference, you don't have to see it, and it handles, when you cancel the timer, a late message that might be in the box. So they are more convenient to use in the Erlang timers. If you set the, uh, a timer that is already running, it is restarted. If you set it to infinity, it is canceled. If you set it to zero, it will not be set, but the message will be immediate, immediately inserted in, the, in your queue before any other external events. This is a guarantee. There is also a possibility to use absolute timeouts, like timeout at four o'clock. Um, are you with me? Yes. The state enter call is, so to say, a minor mode of the callback mode. You may return a list from the callback mode function. Uh, if it contains the atom state enter, uh, the machine will do a state enter call for you every time you go into the function. Every time you change states. When you change state, you will get the state enter call. There it is. <coughs> um, this is not an event, so it cannot be postponed. Uh, there goes that presentation. It cannot, you cannot insert events in the callback and you cannot change states, which would be rather silly to change states when you go into a state. Okay. I have a call lock example. Unfortunately, that's usually the most boring part of the presentation, so I hope you can stay awake here. Um, okay. When you go into locked, we lock the lock and clear the, the button buffer. When you get a button event, we collect all the buttons. If you have the correct code, we unlock, go to state open, start a timer for 10 seconds, add timeout, go back. If we get a wrong code, we start a timer for 30 seconds. If we get a timeout, we clear the buttons. That's about it. Here's just some boilerplate. We have uh, the, in Elixir you don't need this, I guess, if everything is defaulted. We have the module name, you have a name for the server, we have the down and up, the API for the call lock. We have a start function that is used to start link uh, and the name so it can be used in the supervision tree. We have the callback mode, state function, the state and the calls. Um, I use a peculiar API, we have a down up button event. This is just to demonstrate that it doesn't have to get an ex excuse for event insertion. So this is, demonstrates filtering of data before handling it. This could be, instead of finding a line, find an annual line on your input data, instead of decrypting uh, these uh, socket messages before you get an event. So we need a down event and an up event. At the up event, I insert an internal event instead. And then we have a code length uh, status call. Uh, these two are costs, and that one is a call. Uh, the init, init function is the function that the call is called at the start. It, is, it sets uh, the initial state locked, simply. It also sets the process flag, prep exit, to be part in a supervision tree. It also initializes the data. It contains the correct code and the length of the correct code, a cache to that. Here's also a terminate function. The terminate function should, should clean up after the init function. That's the idea. In this case, it's not so much cleaning up to do, but one useful thing to do here is to lock the lock in case we are not instead locked. Um, okay. Here's the handle common events. Uh, that macro, uh, define that macro and the, the common event code length call is simply to answer, reply and keep the same, stay in the same state. Notice that this handle common function does not need to know the state because it does only state, state unspecific things. So it does not need to sort of set a new state. It cannot act on the state. 
we could define another function handle common here that uh, fields in the function name here. So the handle common function would have a name, or would, would have a state that could also be useful. More of the handle common function, here we have the button down that simply stores the button event in the map. And we have a button up event, uh, which compares if that was the same bottom as we passed down, then it's, we have an event. This is a silly filtering, I know, but it's, it's, an, it's an example. Uh, it will insert this next event, the internal event, the under internal button event. Um, so, state locked. Um, this is the state enter code, uh, that box over there. Lock the lock, stay in state. Reset the buttons. And uh, this is the timeout. Uh, when you get a state timeout button, stay in state, reset the buttons. That's it. Now for the logic of the code lock. When we get this internal button event that was inserted by the up button, by the release button, uh, we fill we match out the variables and calculate the new buttons. That is, remember the last n, where the n is the length of the code. And if the, it's the right code, we go to state open. If it's not the right code, we start a timer. Then we have the open state. Very simple. When we go into the state, we start a timer. And we get, when we get the timeout, we go to next state. Next. <laughs> Uh, fooled around here and used uh, the possibility to have a message with the timeout, so the state comes from here, really. Uh, so this one decides to go to locked at timeout. Silly thing to do, but it's, it's an example. Uh, this internal button event uh, here is postponed. And for a code lock, this is also a stupid thing to do. When you have the lock is open and you press the buttons, it caches the buttons. Really not useful, but it's an example of event postponing. It's another stupid example also because this next state function name data is exact, exactly the same as keep state and data. Keep state and data does that. It's not important if you use keep state or next state with the same state. It handles it exactly the same way. Okay. You look rather awake. I have uh, the created gists for this. Uh, here are the links on Erlang.org. I have both an Erlang code example and an Elixir code example. I tested them manually. The Elixir example does not use uh, the mixed behavior gen state machine. There is such a behavior. Uh, it's a wrapper. It's not in uh, Elixir base because uh, there were compati compatibility issues. Since they had to support 19.0, uh, we made an incompatible change in 19.1 on gen statum. So when the 21 release is released, OTP 21, uh, Elixir will release right after that. And then they may have this uh, gen state machine in the base release. Looking forward to that. To that. Um, the summary. Ah, yes, key features. That's the second slide. <coughs> um, but where did that go? I don't think it's that fun. <laughs> All right, I just have to wing it. Uh, we have events that are type tagged go into one callback function. That's a key feature. We have the possibility to postpone an event. We can insert event cleanly. It, it, it's possible to reason about this uh, in, the, in the state machine diagram. Uh, that's kind of addictive, especially the internal events. The state entry calls has the advantage that you don't forget to call a state entry call. Uh, it will get called when you change states. And the possibility to return uh, a list of actions make it possible to return multiple replies and hibernate in the same callback, from the same callback. That's more flexible than Jennifer Sand. We have three different timers. Um, two of them auto canceled, with the third one gives a name. Or are, are easy to read, they're useful. We have the two callback modes, the two sides of the same coin, uh, state-oriented one and uh, the one with any term state and dispatch it as you like. 
So I would say I think that this makes it more useful for state machine than Gen FSM. And if you need any of these features, you may think of it at, instead of Gen Server also. Okay. What about the time? Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, are any plans of adding any of these new features, like the, using the reply to the list of actions and stuff like that, to other behaviors like Gen Server or Gen Event? Should I repeat the question? Uh, yeah. for, for the record, okay. Are there any plans for introducing the list of actions, for instance, into the Gen Server, which is on the remaining behavior that is not deprecated? No hard plans. There have been suggestions on the list that we should do it. I think it's not a bad idea, but we have not found one, someone who wants to do it, really. OK? Uh, first of all, thank you for this. This is great. Um, <coughs> thank you. The first time I wrote a statement, it was really, really hard to figure out what I could return in what content. Yes, um, I've seen the man page. I wrote it, then I, then I saw it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> this is terrible. Uh, we plan to make that Okay, uh, the question is, is it, are there plans to make uh, the documentation uh, more of an introduction, introduction documentation? Well, have you read the, the user's guide, that one? Design I principles? I saw the man page, I didn't, I didn't see the user's guide. Either. Okay, uh, it's an, rather an early link in the man page to the user's guide, it's kind of convoluted, so to say. <laughs> but that one tries to do that. So. If you can read that and say what's missing, please report anything you think should, should, think should be improved. And the GenFSM man page today is a rewrite guide to GenStatum. Um, we will not remove GenFSM for any foreseeable future, I guess, because people use it and it works. So, um, okay, more questions? Again. So the question is, is there interest in a tool that automatically rewrites the NFSMs to Yen statums? Never thought about that. I don't know how needed it is. It's rather simple to do, really. Most of the return, we don't think so. <laughs> Then I see the need for a tool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are we done? I guess so. All right. Thank you.